welcome to Jim Apologetics. This is, of course, your host, Jim. It's been a little while. For those of you who are unaware, I had a little mishap during the storm. Uh, my apartment had flooded, so I had to evacuate from there and have since been holed up in this hotel. My girlfriend is drying her hair, so you'll sometimes hear that during the video, but I wanted to make this rough cut video since it's been so long since I uploaded any content, and I don't want to have too much of a gap between any of my uh, any of my related videos. Anyway, the topic I wanted to discuss today, just to jump into the meat of it, is something that I tweeted about, I think, a week or two ago. And it was this idea that history is not static. What does that mean? Well, obviously, history is not static. Static meaning not changing, not moving. So, history changes every day. But rather than just talking about every day, I'm speaking about different centuries, different eras throughout Christendom, pre-Christendom, and and of course uh, into the future. But I like to focus today on looking at Christian history through population, and through population numbers, I mean, demographics, and geography, uh, when looking at Christianity and comparing it to the theologies of today. If you look at a map of today, as well as a maybe a graph of demography, you'll notice that the vast majority of Christians are belonging to Western theology. So Roman Catholics and various Protestant groups make up by far the bulk of Christianity. I believe there are something like 1.2 billion Catholics, 98% of them are Roman Catholic, so we'll ignore the Eastern Rite Catholics for now. And then if you look at Protestantism, we're looking at probably 800 million, maybe more. It's not entirely accurate to some of the polls you'll look at because it discounts many of the minority religions within an area. For example, Brazil is known as a Catholic country, though about 20% of its population, or at least 20% of the religious people in that country, consider themselves Protestants, either Pentecostals or Evangelicals. So that's not always completely accurate, but we can have a, a rough look at it, and 1.2 billion Catholics, maybe seven or 800 million uh, Protestants, so we're near the 2 billion mark. Uh, we have then another 250 or so Eastern Orthodox Christians, 250 million. And then around 80 million Oriental Orthodox and probably less than 10 million uh, Church of the East, which would be the Nestorian Church. I use the air quotes because they deny that they actually follow the teachings of the heretical Nestorianism. But rather they hold to the culture and the tradition that they have, even though they still claim not to follow his actual theology. Or rather they argue he himself wasn't a Nestorian. That's a topic for another time. But I bring up the ancient church of the East. I bring up the, which I'm just going to colloquially refer to as Nestorian church for now. So anyone who is part of that church, if you, or a Syrian, I'll refer to it as a Syrian. Because we have so many East words. We have Eastern Catholics, Eastern Orthodox, we have Oriental Orthodox, and the word Oriental means Eastern. So all three of these are saying that they're Eastern Orthodox. It's a little difficult to uh, differentiate to someone who may not be familiar with all these terms. Anyway, so when we, I wanted to bring up the Assyrian, the Eastern Orthodox, the Orientals, the Catholics, and the Protestants, because as we look at a map today, like I said, the vast majority of Christianity is Western, but it wasn't always like this. People would look into the past a few hundred years and they'll say, well, Europe was Christendom. To be Christian meant to be European, but it wasn't always like that either. If you go further into the past, uh, in the period right before Islam and even during Islam, Middle Eastern Christianity where my ancestors are from, was one of the great pillars of Christendom. About a third, or, or actually you could argue that a half of all of Christian population of the earth during this period before Islam had risen belonged to the Middle East and North Africa. So these Christians were half of the Christian world, and half the Christian world was no longer in Christian hands when it was taken away. And so that's one thing to look at that's quite interesting, but when we actually delve deeper into this history. We can see that during the time period, even up until the 1200s, the Syriac Oriental Church, so this is in the Oriental Orthodox branch, just the Syriac Rite, we're not even including the Copts or the Tawahedo churches of Ethiopia, Eritrea, or even the Armenian Church, but just the Syriac Church possessed a population as large as Western Christianity in Western Europe. So I'm not talking about Eastern Europe, but specifically in Western Europe. And you say, how can that be? You look at the Syriac church today, it's like five, six million people. Smaller than Judaism, when it's just standing by itself. Oriental Orthodoxy, of course, is around 80 million. 
but just this right used to be so massive. You look at the Nestorians or the Assyrian church, the Church of the East, as they call themselves, and they extended into part of Persia. They covered Mesopotamia. Uh, they had Najran in southern Saudi Arabia. They had um, into Central Asia, so the Turkic steppe, or rather it hadn't become fully Turkic at that point, into Mongolia, into western China, so where the Uyghurs are today, Turkestan. Uh, that used to all be Nestorian clay. Maybe the entire population wasn't Nestorian. But you can see that the map of Nestorian churches, or the Church of the East, was so massive, it dwarfed all of Europe, and therefore it dwarfed Roman Catholicism. Because at this point in history, Catholicism did not discover the Americas. There was no Latin America. There was no such thing as a Latino. It didn't exist back then. The New World had not become Christian, much less Catholic. The Protestants d didn't even exist at this point in time, and even the Eastern Orthodox. There was no great Russian Empire spanning all the way through Siberia. You just had Eastern Orthodoxy um, was part of the Great Church with Catholicism. But if we lead and continue after the uh, schism in 1054, even then, when the two churches, Catholic and Orthodox, would split up, the Orthodox were still mainly concentrated just in Europe. They hadn't expanded into all of Eurasia. So looking at a map alone, you could argue in that time period, if you were around in that time period, even in the time period of the great conquests of the uh, Mongol hordes, you would say the Nestorian, or Church of the East, is one of the great churches of the world. Today, they're looked at as a relic of the past, an ancient heresy, a piece of history, but not a relevant Christian sect. And yet there are still millions of them, but quite small, obviously compared to any other right in Christianity, pretty much. But at one point, they had been the largest Christian group in all of Central Asia, and they possessed land geographically larger than what European Christians had. And unless, you know, if you remove the Church of the East and the Oriental Orthodox, then the vast majority of Christianity comes from the European tradition, even though most of them aren't ethnic Europeans today. So most Christians from Africa today are coming from the European tradition. Anyway, my point is that history is not static. There was once a time when, if we ignore the Church of the East for a moment and go now to the Oriental Orthodox, there's once a, once a time when they possessed some of the great patriarchates. So these did not belong to the Eastern Orthodox, nor did they belong to the Latin Church or Roman Catholicism. They belonged to the Orientals. The Orientals were the majority in Egypt. The Orientals were the majority in Nubia, so that's modern Sudan. The Orientals were the majority in uh, Ethiopia, and Eritrea. They were the majority in parts of South Arabia. They were the, you could say actually that they were the majority in uh, Qatar as well. They were the plurality in Syria. So they split domination of Syria between themselves and the Eastern Orthodox were loyal to the Byzantine Empire. They were the majority in Northwestern Arabia. They were the majority in historic Armenia, which includes part of Western Anatolia and a larger chunk of Eastern Anatolia than what you see in the modern Armenian state. Uh, so, so we see that Oriental Orthodoxy had a much larger share. In fact, you could say that they had the lion's share of the Middle East at that point. The Middle East was split between the Nestorian churches, the Orientals, and the Eastern Orthodox. But of these three, the Orientals, if we're talking strictly Middle East and not even including Anatolia, then the Orientals had the lion's share. When you look at today, you say, look at the Orientals, they're 80 million compared to 2 billion other Christians. What a, what a small number. Again, my point is that history is not static. You say, well, the Catholics, it's too late. History's over. The Catholics conquered the New World. There's 1.2 billion Catholics. They're not going anywhere anytime soon. And Latin America will always be Catholic. But again, history's not static. May I refer to you the changes in Catholic demography in Latin America? Guatemala, Nicaragua, Honduras, Costa Rica, Panama are no longer stable, uh, stable majority Catholic countries. Many of them are 40 or even 50% Protestant, or a mix of different Protestant denominations. Brazil, 22% Protestant, a mix of different denominations. Even Chile, which does not have a massive convert rate, has a historic population of Protestantism, around 15 to 17% of the population, or at least of the religious population. So things change. Things change quite quickly. In southern Mexico, believe it or not, the Syriac Oriental Church is exploding in numbers. The same can be said in Guatemala, you have the Syriac Oriental Church, massive amount of Protestantism, and about half a million Eastern Orthodox, which I believe were evangelized to by the Greek Church, so Greek Orthodox Church belonging to Eastern Orthodoxy. If you look at Kenya, 
About 650,000 Eastern Orthodox are there. Tanzania, Uganda, Rwanda, Burundi, Malawi, and Cameroon, I believe, also have substantial Eastern Orthodox missionaries going there. I don't know how how effective they are in most of the countries outside of Uganda and Kenya, but in Kenya and Uganda, uh, the growth is quite large. Uh, still like 1% of the population or less, but growing every single day. So 50 years ago, you couldn't say that there were more than half a million Orthodox Christians in Kenya, but now there are. 60, 50, or 60 years ago, you couldn't say so much of Latin America had become Protestant, but now it is. Do I actually think that uh, Mexico will be fully Protestant? I don't think so, but I don't know everything. Do I think Brazil is going to become uh, Coptic Oriental? Probably not. However, we really don't know. Immigration is one factor. You have a lot of people from the Middle East uh, and, and from East Africa are immigrating to the West. They're bringing their tradition with them, and thus a lot of converts who get into theology, and even those who are just astounded by the beauty of their practices, may go to these faiths. We have to remember that for the last uh, 500 or so years, the Western traditions have been the king of the world in terms of Christendom. But, like we said again, history is not static. There was once a time when the Church of the East held so much power in Asia, the Orientals held the lion's share of the Middle East, and there was actually a time when Eastern Orthodoxy was larger than Roman Catholicism. Roman Catholicism was primarily uh, most of Central Europe and Western Europe. And that was kind of it. It didn't exist in North Africa anymore. It hadn't discovered the New World or Sub-Saharan Africa. And existed in a small minority in um, the Middle East, Lebanon, and part of Syria. But as we can see, great change happened. So I want people to remember that. And when we have arguments about between different denominations, we say, well, we can't take the Oriental seriously. They're a tiny group. They were not always a tiny group. There was once a time when they were larger than the Roman Catholics. You see, I don't want to keep repeating myself, but this is the primary point. We can't say that a group has no sway because it has smaller numbers. Now, I believe that you know, that, that goes to an extent. If your religion has been defunct for like 500 years, and then somebody revives it, and you have like 800 followers in the entire world, and they're all exclusively on the internet, I wouldn't call that a stable religion. But to have relig a religious practice that's been around for about 2,000 years like the Orientals, to simply brush them away because they do not possess the power and the numbers of the other Christian denominations is foolish, especially from an Eastern Orthodox perspective, because though the Eastern Orthodox may, the, the Orthodox may look quite large compared to the Orientals, uh, the Catholics dwarf the Orthodox. So we're, we're in no position to say the Orientals can't be right because of their numbers, otherwise we couldn't be right because of our numbers. And uh, that just goes to show you that numbers are not everything, and number does not have any significance on correct theology, in my opinion. Now, if history proves over the next couple centuries, Catholicism has like a renaissance, and uh, actually not renaissance, forget that, that's a bad word, at least, it's secularism. That's kind of a more conservative uh, restoration, I should say, and the conquest of the new world was divinely ordained. That, that could be a possibility, we're not entirely sure. I do not want to say that uh, that would be 100% incorrect, because again, it would be better for them to be Christians, even if from the Orthodox perspective, the wrong type of Christian, than for the New World to be entirely pagan, because converting them to Orthodox would then be easier. But the point is, numbers do have something to say about history. Catholics were the most successful Christians pound for pound in the last 500 years. No one can deny that. In the last 50 or so years, Protestants have given them a great run for their money on evangelism, missionary status, numbers have been exploding, especially in China, for example, and parts of other parts of Asia. Uh, but that doesn't really mean that that covers all of history. So history could change. There could miraculously be a time when the Orthodox uh, have a, a magnificent restoration, even greater than anything we're seeing today. And all of Central Asia becomes Orthodox, and half of East Africa becomes Orthodox, and then the number game is starting to look more even. Or we could have a situation where the uh, Orientals have a great resurgence in numbers and a, a massive amount of Christians from all over become Oriental. And the Oriental, uh, they spread their jurisdictions throughout the entire world. There is no way for us to know because history is not static. For all we know, the Church of the East could rise again in power. And we could have a massive amount of Christians in Iran looking to have a, you know, some of them who are ex-Muslims could have a pre-Islamic heritage and they choose the... Church of the East, rather than becoming an evangelical or a Protestant. Same with Western China. There, am I saying that I actually think these things are going to happen for sure? No. 
Probably not, but they could. And so it's not wise to use the argument of, well, I have more numbers than you. Because in many debates between Protestants and Orthodox or Protestants and Catholics, you know, here in America, Protestants are the majority, but they, they have not been keeping a tight lid on American tradition and conservatism. And uh, again, I, I would just argue that Protestants of all the Christian branches is not an insult. The Protestants, not mean to be over insulting the uh, Protestants on this, who are watching this channel. Sorry about that. But I, I would argue that Protestants are probably the least correct overall. There are some things that I would agree with Protestants on over Catholics, like the issue of indulgences. Martin Luther had a point there. Uh, there, there are some things I would agree with them. Obviously, as Orthodox, I don't believe in the Pope, so I would agree with the Protestants there. But weight for weight, pound for pound, I would say the Protestant branch is the least correct compared to all the other branches, um, including, of course, the Orientals. So does that mean that Protestantism is correct because it has 10 times the number of the Orientals? I don't think so. I don't think so at all. Uh, so that's just one thing to keep in mind. We have to be historically literate. We have to be historically fair. We have to look at demography. We have to look at geography. We have to realize that uh, the heart of Christianity has moved into many different places throughout time. It had not always been in Europe. Uh, Europe was Christendom for a long time, but not from the very beginning. And uh, now... Europe is not the center of Christendom. In fact, it's a factory of atheism. So we have to look at exactly theology itself, and not just theology, but also the practice of the people following this faith in real life. Because we can argue theology, but then forget to practice in real life. And we can look at numbers and then forget theology. We have to look at all of them. Hope you guys enjoyed this kind of rough cut discussion. I know it's been a while. I'll be back in my jam making... Uh, better edited videos, and some high-quality theological and cultural material. Hit me up if you have any other questions. Oh, and quick announcement. I will be doing live streams coming up. Um, I will repeat this when I start the live stream, but we're going to keep the live streams entirely in English so the whole audience can understand. I don't know how to subtitle in the middle of a live stream. In addition to that... Uh, Let's try to keep it civil and uh, not necessarily debate, but if people of different uh, theologies and uh, religious groups want to ask questions, they can. Or people just want to ask questions, because I get questions all the time on Discord. People saying, Jim, how do you explain this in the Bible? Uh, Jim, I have doubts because of this video. Jim, can you please debunk this Muslim guy or this Jew? And it's like, I could just answer each one of these one by one, or we could all come together on video, answer them once and for all, Everyone sees it, and then that question is dealt with, and we can move on to other questions. So anyway, look, get uh, getting excited for the live streams, and I'll talk to you guys later.